He discovered the solution and he lacked a pen. He had a tobacco knife. So he cut the solution into a stone on a bridge. And he, he said, as I walked, here there dawned on me the notion that we must admit in some sense a fourth dimension of space for the purpose of calculating with triples. And this is the phrase I love. An electric circuit seemed to close and a spark flashed forth. And what he gets there is this fantastic idea that he spent a lot of time thinking, a lot of time thinking while walking. And he created this equation or derived this equation, uh, which gave us Quaternions and now allows us to speak across the oceans. Life's Third Act is a podcast dedicated to helping you get the most out of your retirement. Sponsored by Tucker Allen, attorney CPA Joe Cordell features guests each week to discuss prominent topics for those over 55. Here's attorney CPA Joe Cordell. Welcome to another episode of Life's Third Act. Uh, This week we have a guest on to talk about what is one of my favorite subjects, meaning that I'm a true believer in this thing. And it's almost something magical for health and longevity. So we'll kind of lead into this uh, a little bit slowly. Let me let me introduce our guest. Uh, it's Professor Shane O'Mara, correct? That's correct. Yes, and uh, and you're at Trinity College in Dublin. That's right. And can you talk a little bit about your um, kind of science focused or brain focused uh, specialty? Sure, I'm a professor of experimental brain research at Trinity College. And my primary research interest is in the brain systems that are concerned with learning and memory and how they're affected by stress and depression. And uh, I have collateral interests in other things, which I guess we're going to talk about. Uh, we, we will. And we'll just, we'll just jump in the pool here. Uh, the subject is walking. Now, some may think, well, that doesn't seem like a very profound thing to discuss, but I'm telling you, it's almost supernatural, the implications that walking has. And I suspected this, but but your book, In Praise of Walking, um, lays a sort of scientific and historical foundation for, for the many, many benefits that many have suspected are associated with walking, but they just didn't have a basis anywhere to put their finger on. Can you talk a little bit about how you came to this investigation? Sure. So, uh, long story short, uh, I could tell you the long story, but the, the short story is probably <laughs> well. You probably want to get bad, in bed before too late tonight. <laughs> exactly. Um, I, I've always been a walker, and I've always enjoyed walking. And uh, I, one of my most joyful things to do is is to discover a new city on foot. Um, I think uh, there's no better way to to learn about a new locale, a new place than to wander about at random. And uh, the idea for writing a book on walking was actually one that came out of a conversation that I was having uh, where my uh, literary agent and I were talking about various things to do with ideas for books. And uh, I happened to mention that actually I really enjoyed walking. And he said, why don't you write a book on walking? And I said, actually, you're quite right. I should write a book on walking. And that fell, or the the topic falls naturally out of my own research interests because, as we I'm sure we'll talk about, the brain regions that are concerned with learning and memory are also brain regions that are profoundly affected in all sorts of ways by physical activity and, in particular, walking. Yeah, and of course there are lots of physical activities, and we know that that in the West, especially, there's this almost an obsession among younger people with more extreme, what are now called extreme sports. The idea that you have to put your body through this great stress, or there has to be, you know, the philosophy, you've heard no no pain, no gain. So people who think that they have to do something, you know, really uh, uh, trying with their body in order to get a benefit, uh, your research suggests this is not true. I want to remind you that it's very important to us to get subscriptions. Um, For you to press that like button is helpful, but the subscribe button is the most important thing to us. 
And, you know, we don't sell a product on here. I mean, actually, the show is sponsored by Tucker Allen, so we do talk about Tucker Allen. But to be honest with you, the the efforts that we put into this show is something that is of personal value to us more than monetary, quite frankly. We do love to do it because we think that we're being of great value to, to many of you. Let us know that. Uh, you Like us, yes. But the most important thing we look at is subscriptions. For the average person, that's absolutely correct. Um, I think what we've done in our society is kind of venerate people who can go to extremes in terms of athletic performance. And that's fine. And that's cool. You know, I love the Olympics and uh, I love seeing these amazing people doing these astonishing things. But they're not the measure of the average person. They they are unique individuals and they're capable of doing things that the rest of us can't do. But what the rest of us can do, those of us who are lucky enough to be able to walk, is to take regular bouts of exercise uh, during the course of every day, uh, which in and of itself is profoundly health altering, health gaining, health giving. Um, but it goes far, far beyond health. Um, Walking, uh, we're, we're kind of cursed with this one simple word, walking, uh, whereas we walk for lots of reasons. Health is one of them. Social walking is another one. Uh, walking for creativity is another. Walking for mental health benefits is another. There are lots and lots of reasons uh, why we can walk. And if we look at humans and think about what it is that we're very good at, we're not exceptionally good runners. Gazelles can outrun us. Lions and tigers can outrun us. Uh, We're not exceptional climbers, but what we are very, very good at doing is walking and walking very long distances for very prolonged periods of time. And I I opened the book with the story of uh, a a story which I think is a a scientific investigation, but also a story which I think is really lovely. And this is of uh, an Italian man in his early 60s, who was not especially fit, not especially unfit, uh, who undertook to walk the Via Alpina, uh, which is a a long walk of uh, several thousand kilometres across the the kind of the border with Italy and Germany and France and Switzerland. And uh, what they found uh, in this really interesting study was that they hooked this guy up to a whole variety of instruments to measure his adaptation. They took various samples from him and all of those kinds of things. And what they discovered, uh, which is shouldn't come as a surprise to us, but I think always does, is that his body adapted quickly to the rigors of walking 20 to 30 kilometers a day, day in, day out. And uh, if you were to try and run a marathon, you know, 30 kilometers or so day in, day out, that would destroy your body, Uh, your knees, your hips, all (laughs) sorts of things would go wrong very, very quickly, unless you've been specially trained to do this. But the average person can get up and walk and walk very considerable distances from very early in life until very late in life. And, you know, I think about kind of the evolutionary implications that that we became bipeds and are kind of uniquely biped, at least at, you know, full time. And that associated with that was much of the progress and and I assume our cognitive development, et cetera. And you wonder to what extent uh, they're associated. And you would argue, I guess, that there is this association. Yeah, I would argue, actually, in fact, there's a very deep association. Um, you know, if you if you consider how humans populated the planet, we did this in a pre-mechanized era. You know, the the, the best we had by uh, with mechanical things were were uh, horse-drawn carts or, or boats. You know, that were wind-powered, and somehow we spread right throughout the continents. Uh, we spread right across the face of the planet, and we did it. And this is where I think uh, social walking and and cognition kind of come together. We did it in groups. We did it in tribes. We did it in families. Uh, We did it as uh, communities. And it had to be like that. One guy walking off into the wilderness with a spear is not going to conquer anything. But a couple of families walking together, attuned to each other, planning together where they're going to go, can do amazing things. And they can walk 
very, very long distances. And of course, in those days, there were no borders. Uh, so you could cross from one region to another or your ability to cross from one region to another was really limited only by your own ingenuity. And uh, humans, of course, are kind of restless. Uh, we're always looking for over the horizon. We're looking for new things. And this is the, the our ability to walk, to carry children, to carry food, to carry weapons, to carry supplies. All of those kinds of things were things that came naturally with the form of walking that we engage in because our hands are free. We are upright. We can look at the far horizon and we can pay joint attention to things together. And that's the key point that uh, uh, our walking is a social phenomenon just as much as it is an individual phenomenon. Uh, and would you, and I know that you wouldn't want to divorce the social piece from from the walking, but um, perhaps that, would you agree is less essential than than this varied environment versus one who might simply take at face value the idea of walking and say, well, gee, I'm going to walk on a treadmill in a room um, or I'm going to walk around a circle in a gym and just walk and walk and walk by themselves. Um, it, when you mention the history of humanity, we think about you know, this nomadic quality and the, the the thing about discovery. And so your brain is engaged when you're walking in an environment where things are happening around you, I guess, like outside. I guess that's the way it always was, in fact. Um, so I, I tend to think, um, and you tell me if I'm correct, that that is really a critical component of the benefits that you associate with walking. I, I think of it, that's correct, but I think of it as a two-way street. You know, so you, you have to think about uh, our ability to imagine wh where it is that we might walk to. This is a, you know, a, a really remarkable uh, cognitive capacity to imagine things that haven't yet come into being and might come into being. Um, and we also have to take the inputs that we're exposed to and come up with ideas about what we might do based on that. And as it turns out, as I, as I mentioned earlier on in the, in the conversation, the brain areas that are concerned with learning and memory are the same brain areas that are concerned with imagination. They're also, would you believe, the same brain areas that are concerned with thinking forward and thinking backwards in time. And their activity is paced by the speed with which we walk. Huh. So these things all come together in one remarkable brain system, which I have yet to name, but I will now, the hippocampal formation, which talks to much of the rest of the brain. So people, and I've, I'm certainly familiar with the term hippocampus, but that is the part of the brain then that's associated with um, uh, creativity, for example? Uh, engagement of the hippocampus is vital to creativity, for sure. And, you know, as we think about some of the great discoverers who often talked about walking and thinking and in the process of that, they, you know, they had just fresh ideas. And Einstein was one of those who, you you know, those famous pictures of him, his hands behind his back and his head maybe down and he's thinking, you would encourage you to be engaging the senses and looking around as well, right? Yes, exactly. And, uh, and in fact, I think this is something that philosophers and mathematicians and others have kind of realized and psychology and neuroscience have come too late, uh, that actually walking is a great boon to creativity and a great boon to thinking. And, and the example that uh, I like to give is uh, a, a former uh, colleague, a long deceased colleague in Trinity. Uh, the, the reason we're able to speak to each other is because of these marvelous developments in computer technology. And uh, these marvelous developments are actually based on a type of mathematics called quaternions, um, which drive the game engines in, in computers and they're used in physics and computer graphics. And these were invented by a mathematician at Trinity named uh, William Rowan Hamilton, who, who lived in the last century, sorry, the century before last in the, in the 1800s. And Hamilton used to walk. He was the, uh, the uh, astronomer royal, as it was known at the time. Um, and he used to walk from the observatory in Dunsink in North Dublin to Trinity every day after having done his night's observations. And he used to think about other types of mathematics. And one day uh, on these walks, 
Uh, there's a, a great quote, in fact, I'll, I'll read the quote to you. He discovered the solution and he lacked a pen. He had a tobacco knife. So he cut the solution into a stone on a bridge. And he, he said, as I walked, here there dawned on me the notion that we must admit, in some sense, a fourth dimension of space for the purpose of calculating with triples. And this is the phrase I love. An electric circuit seemed to close and a spark flashed forth. And what he gets there is this fantastic idea that he spent a lot of time thinking, a lot of time thinking while walking. And he, so he was incubating the idea, testing different variations on the idea. And then the aha moment, the electric circuit closed and the spark flashed forth. And he created this equation or derived this equation, uh, which gave us Quaternions and now allows us to speak across the oceans. Wow. I'm sure that there are countless stories of of ideas of which we're the beneficiaries, which were perhaps the catalyst may have been uh, was walking and thinking. And, you know, it makes clear to me also why other forms of exercise, you know, are not as widely beneficial as you describe. For example, uh, let's say that rather than walking, that each of these people were running. And we all kind of get this sense that if Einstein were running or if we were running, we're probably going to be less inclined to be, you know, to allow our creative juices to flow. Instead, you know, we're, we're suffering through this, this agonizing experience or at least a more challenging physical experience. So it's clearly redirecting our attention from, from all these things that you've been discussing to our body and, and what's going on with it. And that would seem to be characterized by arguably all sports. And again, as you pointed out early on, sports are beneficial, but I was hoping that you would go further and rather than say simply that, 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 yeah, we can all walk, but we don't have the special gift to people who can run, but to say even, even I think more pointedly here that that's a different road. That's pursuing something different. There's a point between, you know, health and, and cognitive benefits. I think there's a fork in the road where, people who are engaged in extreme sports have decided that they're on a different road. They're doing something else to be admired, certainly, but it's not to be confused with a pursuit of health. It's a pursuit of something else, uh, which we all arguably respect more, it seems, those of us who, who follow extreme sports, but, but it's not to be confused with the road you are advocating for, uh, which is a different experience, health as well as cognitive and yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I couldn't agree more. I think, you know, what the average person needs and wants is not what you're going to get from extreme sports. I think extreme sports are wonderful to look at. I, I'm not an extreme sports person, as as um, I'm, I'm sure you realize. But for health gaining purposes for the average person, there is an activity that we can all engage in. It's easy. It doesn't require much other than a nice pair of shoes. And if you're here in Dublin, a, a decent raincoat, and uh, you're away with it. That's all you need to do. Uh, and you can make it really enjoyable by just going for a walk with somebody else. Or you can go for a walk and to think, you know, if you have a problem to solve, get away from your laptop, get away from your keyboard, get away from your books. Think about it. And that spark may flash forth for you, too. So I'm putting together here the elements which are much better described in your book. Um, in praise of walking, is that it's best if it's outside. Is that a good general rule? I think that's a good general rule, yes. Um, it's good if it's uh, social. Yes, absolutely. Um, and to the extent that we're in an environment that engages our senses more, uh, that's a good thing. Yeah, more green than anything else if possible. Uh, now, what about the length? Do you have any opinion regarding how often, uh, how do you create the optimal benefit that you describe? Yeah, so th there's actually, would you believe, quite a bit of data now because of smartphones uh, and other means of tracking people, which we didn't have uh, even 10 years ago. So what we do know is that there are uh, kind of minimum activity thresholds uh, which you need to be above. So the general rule I give people is 5,000 steps more than you're currently doing. 
because most people don't walk very much. How do we know this? We know this from smartphone data and other uh, forms of tracking data. The average adult walks somewhere around about four or 5,000 steps uh, a day in the Western world. The Japanese are probably the best walkers. They, they do around six, six and a half thousand steps. Um, and uh, uh, in Western Europe, depending on, on where you are, uh, you're looking at around about, and the same for North America, somewhere around about the four to 5,000 step mark. Now, your environment matters a lot. In the United States, people in New York walk the most. Uh, it's a tremendously walkable city, and it's not a city to drive in. Um, San Franciscans walk an awful lot again, and uh, Bostonians walk a lot, again, because they're old cities uh, and they're not very car friendly. Um, and the same is true in, in other parts of the world. Cities that uh, are car unfriendly are cities that people tend to walk uh, a lot more in. Now, if you track people through time and you look at how much walking they do and you ask, what is their all cause mortality? In other words, what are they or, or how likely are they to die of anything? It could be cancer. It could be heart disease. It could be a metabolic disorder. Uh, it could be, you know, those are the kind of the big killers are, are cancer and heart disease. Um, what you find is your probability of dying from something drops dramatically once you're getting above somewhere like five to seven and a half thousand steps per day, which isn't so very much. The average child when it's learning to walk is putting out around about a thousand steps an hour. Um, and we, yeah, and we know from uh, studies in non-mechanized um, traditional lifestyle societies like the Hadza in uh, Africa that the average male walks between 14 and about 18,000 steps a day and the average female walks somewhere like 12 to maybe 14 or 15,000 steps a day. And they have astonishing heart health and they have uh, really low lipid profiles. So they're, they do not have high levels of cholesterol and they don't have lots of anti-inflammatories. Or sorry, they, they don't have lots of pro-inflammatories floating around in their blood. So these, so these examples, though, um, some people who listen to this may think, well, these are Africans. Uh, we know that Africans often don't have long lives. But you would argue the reason they don't have long lives, they don't have some of the Western things that we have. But if they had the habits you describe in a Western environment, they would be setting records in longevity. Well, well, let me shock you because the, the Hadza uh, have been studied intensively and there are plenty of Hadza in their 70s and 80s. Uh, and they are still walking 10 to 20,000 steps per day. Uh, so it, it, it's... Uh, Even under their conditions. It, yeah, they're living actually quite a healthy lifestyle. Um, they're, they, they're not tracked by predators. They've got good access to food. And, uh, you know, they have all the, uh, a lot of other things that uh, you might be surprised that they have access to. There, yeah. there, there's a recent book called Burn by Herman Ponser at Duke University who describes uh, uh, the many studies that he has done uh, with the Hadza. And they're, they're really very, very interesting. Um, I think uh, once you get out of, of the early years, your chances of living a decently long life as a Hadza are actually pretty good. So the averages you read about are being pulled down by what's happening in those first few years. In those first years, exactly, yeah. Very interesting. Uh, so I, I wonder if you can be, if if maybe you would suggest that people take a more uh, purposeful perspective regarding the utility of walking. By that, I mean uh, that they they consciously decide, you know, I'm going to go walking. There's this thing I want to work out. There's this problem. There's this issue in my at work. There's this matter in my family, whatever it is. Uh, you know, people talk about the importance of of cutting off your phones and their software to do this. To, to you, you indicate even on iPhones. I don't know what they call it. The do not disturb, where you're supposed to be engaged in what one author of a popular book has called deep thinking. And and the yeah, what what's Kyle Newport. Okay, you know. So what spawned this book is is that the notion that we have very little time for deep thinking, that we're always on this superficial level responding to various things, calls for our attention throughout the day. And so we, we fail to do the thing that, that arguably would be most 
most beneficial, transformative even, but it, but we never get to that because we're always dealing with little tasks. And so they, they, they say it's important to isolate yourself and, and set aside time for deep thinking. It sounds like what you're describing here is the perfect prescription for a deep thinking, so to speak. Yeah, I think, you, you know, deep thinking on two feet, wandering about is actually a very pleasurable and easy way to engage in thinking. Uh, and in fact, just where the, the, the book In Praise of Walking is concerned, much of that book I actually wrote while w- walking, would you believe? Uh, what I would do is prepare bullet points um, and uh, I would go for a walk in my local park and I would take a dictaphone and dictate the book as I was walking about. And uh, it's a really easy way. I, I think if you want to solve a problem when you're walking, it, it's easy to become kind of uh, distracted by the phone in your pocket, you feel like you have to check it, you have to do a lot of things like this. What you need to do is kind of prime yourself to engage in directed thinking. So taking Hamilton as our example, he would think about quaternions. Obviously, he would be thinking about his tobacco knife, he would be thinking about his pipe or whatever else it was that he happened to be doing. Uh, but he always brought the focus of his thought back to this particular problem. And I think if you're using walking for kind of creative problem solving, you should use it in a kind of a directive kind of way. Give yourself permission to wander away from your thinking for a, a little while, but you must drag yourself back to the problem again. So you have this cycle of on task, off task, on task, which actually turns out from the psychology of creative problem solving to be probably the best way to solve uh, difficult problems that uh, you you really find are kind of fuzzy in definition and that are difficult to get a handle on. So we're going to break here because we're breaking this into two shows. So just go to the next show to see this conversation continue. Another episode of Life's Third Act. You've been listening to Life's Third Act, a podcast for thriving in retirement. Sponsored by Tucker Allen, your estate and elder law advisors. Each week we discuss topics and answer questions to help you better plan for your future. For more information, visit TuckerAllen.com. Subscribe and listen again next week for another edition of Life's Third Act. The choice of a lawyer is an important decision and should not be based solely on advertisements.